we start with you, Simon Moxness, you are from Equinor. floor is yours. Thank you very much. Start the clock. There we are. We live in turbulent times. Um, as we've seen also earlier today, the climate crisis uh, is manifesting itself. Picture to the my left, uh, one third of Pakistan under water, wiping out uh, communities. Um, at the same time, we have a full-fledged war in Europe where uh, energy has been weaponized, energy used as a weapon. We see now how Russia targets uh, energy infrastructure and uh, Ukrainian people are going a very tough winter, have, have a tough winter in, uh, for, before them. In that context, it's uh, looking at uh, Dr. Nansen. It uh, gives us an understanding for, for what we have to do of effort to build, rebuild that system. And uh, critical infrastructure like Nord Stream has been uh, blown up. Leading to a volatile market that uh, no one wants, least of, uh, of that us, uh, an energy company that are for doing big investments uh, are uh, uh, favoring stability from chaos. Uh, in such a system, uh, when we're talking about energy, I find the energy trilemma figure quite uh, descriptive. Energy supply must be secure, and when the energy supply is threatened, that is very soon gets the one and only focus, but in the long run and in the big system, uh, energy must be affordable to the end user. The, energy, the end user must be willing and able to pay the price for energy. And the energy system must be decarbonized. Not all CO2 emissions come from, uh, from the energy system. Uh, cement making, steel making, Aluminum making has their fair share, but the major share are for, from our energy consumption. Um, as, as a responsible society and a responsible, oops, sorry for that, and a responsible uh, company, we need, however, to maintain the focus, to be able to have a consistent strategy and not zigzag around within this trilemma, uh, according to the current political context. Okay, then a bit about Norway's role as an energy provider to Europe today. The numbers have been uh, mentioned before, but approximately then today, 25% of the gas supply to Europe comes from Norway, mainly piped gas with a primary energy content of approximately 1,200 terawatt hours. Compared then to Norwegian hydropower, uh, that is a factor of 10. Uh, compared to the yearly, I should have some electricity coming out of Norway also, but, but, but the 15 terawatt hour we export in a normal year is 1% then of the primary energy uh, content in that, nat in that natural gas. Um, it is um, Norwegian pipe gas to Europe are the natural gas delivered in the world with the lowest upstream emissions. The emissions you, uh, uh, that you have uh, related to the extraction and the transportation of that gas. Um, approximately six grams per kilowatt hour when you burn the gas. Uh, you emit approximately 220 grams per kilowatt hour. So you can add six grams to that. If you compare with, uh, with the Russian piped gas, the number there is approximately 20 grams per kilowatt hour. And if you compare with the average EU LNG mix, it's more than 10 times that. And that's the reason why I say that the last gas molecule that is consumed in Europe with the current, uh, uh, call it, quite uh, ambitious targets, that will and should be Norwegian piped gas. However, 
This figure is also an important one. It shows the historic and predicted future gas export from uh, the Norwegian continental shelf. Uh, we are peaking, or uh, the peak was around 120 billion standard cubic meter. Uh, this year it will be approximately 110. 40 out of those comes from the troll field. And then another 25 billion cubic meters per year from Oymer Lange. Troll was found in 1979, Oymer Lange in 1997. In open areas in the North Sea, where we are allowed to look uh, for gas, it's not likely that we have any, or it's very unlikely that we have any such big gas fields again. That means that the decline, I worked in an industry that where the decline is always 10 years ahead. But due to this, call it simple physics, this decline from 2030 and onwards will come. And then we will explore, we will uh, look for more resources that can fatten the tail a bit, but it cannot stop the decline. And that in itself, if you then look at us as a company, and actually also, also Norway as an as energy provider, is in itself a driver for trans thinking transition. And that comes on top of uh, the repower in Fit for 55 and repower EU and the plants. And that was a backdrop for launching uh, the Norway Energy Hub project uh, uh, last year. We call it an industrial plan for transforming uh, the Norwegian continental shelf uh, for the future energy markets. This is, not, this is too big for one single company, so this is not a plan for Equinor itself. We are prepared to take a a uh, significant uh, portion of it, but this is a plan for Norway, for the Norwegian government, for the, uh, our comp competitors and for the supply industry. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's not built on, uh, on, on nothing. It is built on significant political ambitions uh, that uh, um, that is um, uh, the latest, call it concrete uh, example on that, is the white paper delivered by the last government just before last summer uh, called Energy to Work. And it's a very good document and it points out that uh, yes, in, uh, in uh, 10 and 20, maybe 20 years to come, it's still uh, Norwegian oil and gas industry will still uh, play a significant role uh, towards Europe. But uh, we also think have, uh, need to have a broader energy offer. And they mention wind, especially offshore wind. They mention uh, CO2 transportation and storage and hydrogen production, which is good. That is uh, uh, consistent with, with our view. Um, what, what that uh, plan lack is concrete ambitions. And what does it take to come there? And that is what uh, Norway Energy Hub is all about. And uh, if we succeed, it will be an important cornerstone in achieving national uh, climate ambitions. More important uh, than that is that it will contribute to technology development and also uh, new services that will be uh, vital for the rest of the world uh, reaching their climate targets, especially Europe. Um, it will build on and further develop Norwegian expertise and supplier industry, which is, of course, also of extreme importance to, uh, to our, us and our politicians. Um, and it will provide more access to renewable power, which is important to, to build new green industries in Norway. And it will establish new value chains that can stand firmly on, on feet on their own feet. Because remember, a value chain does that does not generate value is not a value chain. So, a bit about uh, uh, the towers. First of all, all these four legs of, uh, of uh, the energy hub uh, are actually interconnected. Let me take an example. B 
the step out of uh, uh, blue hydrogen. Uh, to produce blue hydrogen, as mentioned before, that is reforming natural gas to hydrogen and CO2, capturing the CO2 and store it underground. That can be done with a capture rate between 90, yeah, at least at 95%, up to 98% actually. But if you do not have control of your upstream emissions that I mentioned uh, uh, a bit earlier, blue hydrogen is not a green product. If you have methane leakages along, that, uh, along your, your production line, it shall not be very many percentages of, uh, of methane seeping, seeping out before that blue hydrogen is not green. So upstream emissions are important to build such a factory and also to decarbonize uh, the offshore oil and gas uh, sector because electrification Apart from energy, of course, energy efficiency, electrification is the most important and most effective measure to reach those targets. Then you need more power. Uh, we say that we should aim for having developed, that means having developed at least 10 gigawatt uh, offshore wind within 2035. Correspond actually quite good with the national targets formulated by this government of uh, 30 gigawatts decided, I think they say, within 2040. Uh, and to produce blue hydrogen, you need access to storage cap the CO2 storage capacity and infrastructure. Uh, 40 million tons per year, well, that is... Uh, today, Norway emits 49 million tons CO2 per year. And uh, we will emit far less in, uh, in 2035, maybe 20 million tons. So uh, that capacity is more than, than the double of the national uh, emissions. The main customers will not be the Norwegian market, it will be the European market. 10 gigawatts offshore wind will produce approximately 40 to 45 terawatt hours electricity per year. Let's just check the time. Looks good. A bit more about the, call it the different legs than in the, in, uh, in Norway energy. First, a bit about hydrogen. The world hydrogen market today is approximately 90 million tons hydrogen per year. It is vital for the world's food, food security because a, a large share of this hydrogen is used by the fertilizer, fertilizer industry to make ammonia. So, without this uh, volume of hydrogen, there will also be a full-fledged food crisis in the world. Uh, the production of these 90 million tons with the hydrogen emits over 800, I think it's 830 million tons CO2. So that in itself is, is an important uh, element to attack if you are going to reduce global emissions. This shows uh, the assumed volumes of hydrogen in IEA's uh, two degree and one and a half degree scenario, distributed between blue hydrogen and then green hydrogen made from electrolysis. It's a massive upscale. Um, we think that blue hydrogen is a way to quickly scale up, um, scale up uh, uh, hydrogen production. Um, we talked about 2 gigawatt. Well, if we really see that there is a market, that there is an emerging market for hydrogen as an energy carrier, we foresee that we can scale up to 10 gigawatts production capacity of blue hydrogen. That is en enough to fill a pipeline. But to put it in scale then again, uh, when that pipeline is to be filled by green hydrogen, because sooner or later it will be green, uh, all hydrogen will be green, then you need uh, a power capacity actually exactly the same uh, as the Norwegian hydropower capacity as it is today, 130 terawatt hours. So again, that shows, uh, tells you a bit about the ability to scale up production quickly, which is the main driver for blue hydrogen as I see it. But to do such investment in such factories, we need to know that there is a 
market in the other end. That's why cooperation with the EU, that will be the main market, uh, because hydrogen is not easy to transport over large distances, but pipeline infrastructure that we actually already have in place can be a good uh, uh, tool there. CCS, we are building. We are building Northern Lights, which is a project created actually uh, due to uh, Norwegian political ambitions. The Northern Lights, part of the long ship uh, project, it's is heavily subsidized, and, and, and the, the realization of this project is, has been totally dependent on, uh, on support from the Norwegian government. Now it's up to us and our partner Total and Shell to show that this can be a viable business model. Because we do not get support to operating this plant for very many years, it, we have to show that this is a business that can stand on its own feet. And uh, CCS is vital for decarbonizing the hard to abate sector, like I mentioned, the steel industry, the cement industry, also waste handling. There is no, you can't, you can't electrify that because the emissions from the cement industry is part of the process of, of, of producing. Uh, it's not directly related, or all emissions are not directly related to the energy consumption. We have vast resources in the North Sea. Um, 80 gigatons, uh, I think the total, what is what MPD foresee that there can be a total volume, a storage volume in the, in, the Northern, uh, in the North Sea. That is 130 years of German emissions at the current level. By doing uh, the Longship and Northern Lights project, uh, pro project, we are very relevant for all potential possible future customers in Europe, and there are a lot of them uh, out there. Um, uh, German Steelworks, um, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, Heidelberg Cement in Breivik is the first uh, customer for the Northern Lights. And when Yara um, announced that they would uh, decarbonize their production of fertilizer in Schlösskil, the phase one of uh, of Northern Lights was sold out. Uh, we are now eager to start also on the phase two, and you see we can then do that scale up within 2025, 2027. Um, Equinor is now has been awarded a license called Smeheia uh, between actually the Northern Lights Reservoir and Bergen, uh, and that is a possibility for a rather big scale up. Then we are talking about 20 million tons per year, and at such volumes you can start uh, thinking about building a pipeline and building, getting volume up and uh, uh, so that you can invest in, in pipeline transport is an important enabler for getting the cost down of the transportation <coughs> and storage element. We believe that the transportation and storage cost will be well within uh, the uh, uh, cost of emitting CO2 um, as set by the EU ETS system uh, within a few years. But we still need customers, and there need to be um, willingness to pay for decarbonized products. Fingernai, you know this figure. I guess you made it when we tried to sell in the Highwind Demo project at, yeah, soon, 20 years ago, at least 15. This is the area needed to double Norwegian, uh, um, or to... to uh, um, scale up offshore wind uh, to match Norwegian hydropower uh, production. Again, those famous 130 gigawatts. Um, it's a significant area, but it's only 1% of Norway's total uh, area along the coast. So by proper planning, good processes and systems for handling uh, coexistence, this is doable. Um, and uh, we were quite content when the government uh, presented their ambitions again for, for uh, uh, the road towards 2040 with 30 gigawatts in, um, offshore wind as the goal. Um, last thing I will just mention, Trollvin. 
can be the next step. We are now, I mean, two weeks ago, we started the first uh, turbine on Hyvin Tampen. Uh, today I was in and checked on the system, and we are now doing daily CO2 savings, adding up to 100,000 tons per year from the first three turbines. So, when we are now delivering Hyvin Tampen, the next step is the important thing for us. Uh, of course, the pr ongoing processes on Utsira Nord and Sørlige Nordsjø 2, we are an eager developer there. But through the Trollin project, we have also seen uh, a possibility to have a fill-in project where we can build a significant uh, large-scale wind park, one gigawatt, that can deliver uh, power to Kolsnes, which is a very strained uh, point in the Norwegian uh, energy grid due to tr uh, transmission uh, bottlenecks from the fjords where the power station is and the coast where the big uh, industrial suppliers are. But that, I'm done. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, thank you. Uh, we have time, I think, now in this uh, session only for one question. Uh, is there uh, enough uh, Norwegian natural gas available uh, to meet the demand from Europe for hydrogen in, in the years to come? That depends on what that demand will be. Hmm. Again, see it now. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a difficult question. I mean, what I've shown you today is from the open sources. Of course, we have a, 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 what we report into the revised national budget every year, but those data are not open. But uh, again, I mean, uh, I think we are able to, to deliver significant volumes also uh, after 2050, but they will be uh, not, it cannot be compared uh, to what we see today. But then remember that this 10 gigawatt I talked about needs uh, a 10 BCM as feed gas. Again, one tenth of what we have, uh, have today. So uh, that's why that is a reasonable size, because we see that we can deliver that in a long perspective, maybe towards 2070, which is needed to do such a big investment. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We see you later in the panel discussion. Uh, Next speaker is from uh, Norse, Sara Elin Gasta, and we will continu continue on the topic of hydrogen in the, from the North Sea. Yeah, everybody here. The me? floor is yours. Thank you very much, Magnus. Yes, thank you all very much, and uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, it's been a really, really good. Uh, a set of uh, set of lectures, and I also want to thank Anders for uh, pushing my own transition from being normally a CCS expert to now being a hydrogen expert. Uh, I got the uh, <laughs> distilling. <laughs> Even the title was given to me. So uh, now, but to, to be all seriousness, uh, many of us in research um, are new to hydrogen, as are many in industry, except for those who, of course, been producing hydrogen for for many decades for feedstock. Uh, so, but I think it's just an indication of how fast this area is growing, um, that, uh, that we all get on board and uh, start to put our efforts uh, towards this uh, blue and, and green hydrogen. I think it's been introduced already a few times. Norway is a small country. Everybody here knows that. Very few emissions uh, coming from Norway. Uh, but what are very unique about Norway's emissions and where are the pointers? No, nope, that was not the pointer help me here, here we go, um, is that the emissions from Norway are primarily coming from the maritime sector and from oil and gas extraction in addition to other industries. It's not coming from power, which is very different from most of Europe, uh, or heat, uh, home heating. And that really gives us a very nice opportunity when you think about hydrogen and the challenges that we face is how we're going to use hydrogen for industry uh, Norway, although small numbers, uh, amounts of emissions and, uh, to abate, uh, really provides an enormous impact uh, that can be had by developing technologies uh, in Norway. And we have to remember that Norway, although with very few emissions, still has the same types of ambitions uh, of uh, drastic cuts by, by 2030. So if we're, uh, we in Norway are going to do anything about uh, national emissions, it's most likely going to come from, from these sectors. 
Uh, it's been already mentioned quite a bit about Norwegian gas exports. Uh, exports from Norway, uh, from what I can gather, are primarily used for heating and cooking. Uh, and of course, the latest news, or this is not the latest, this was September, <laughs> changes very quickly. Uh, at that point, 25%, now we're hearing 27% of expected gas needs for this year. Uh, but to remember that those gas exports also amount to approximately uh, 200 million tons per year of CO2 emissions by the end users. Uh, so although Norway are uh, lowest in the world in production emissions, uh, of course the gas still contains uh, carbon uh, at the end. Okay, so we're here to talk about hydrogen uh, and the green transition. Uh, again, for Norway, uh, has very strong ambitions to enable hydrogen as central to the green transition. Uh, and for this country, it's about decarbonizing industry uh, and transport uh, domestically, uh, particularly with heavy vehicles and the maritime industry, but also talking about decarbonizing those exports to Europe. Um, and we should be reminded that hydrogen is not just linked to climate change, it's really also contributing to the, great, the bigger package, energy security, uh, how we uh, continue to develop economically, grow industry, grow new green industries, uh, how do we uh, obtain a more diverse energy mix and accessibility. Uh, so hydrogen is it's not just uh, about the climate, uh, although that, of course, is high on the, on the list. As I mentioned, uh, Norway's hydrogen ambitions and goals are very high. This was a statement coming from the Norwegian Ministry of Petroleum Energy. I don't know exactly. I think it was in the hydrogen strategy that was in a couple years back, uh, saying that the government will contribute in building a comprehensive value chain for hydrogen where production, distribution, and utilization is developed in parallel. Uh, this just goes to show you that even the government realizes that the, the whole value chain needs to be addressed and put a lot of effort into uh, bringing up uh, technology readiness levels and our ability to really carry out a large-scale transformation uh, of what is now a relatively small uh, hydrogen uh, uh, industry connected tightly to um, fertilizers, uh, um, going much, much beyond that. Okay, so the reason for this, um, a, a bit of a... a national uh, emphasis on hydrogen is also looking towards Europe and its own hydrogen demands that are expected to increase. This is showing you volumes of hydrogen in metric tons uh, from the current uh, levels which uh, are, are in the existing feedstock uses growing dramatically uh, by 2050. These numbers are uh, coming out of a, a council of optimistic hydrogen technology uh, and other companies. Uh, and that amounts to about 25% uh, of EU energy demand, or about 2,250 terawatt hours by, by 2050. And you can see here the breakdown uh, of expected uses or end users for hydrogen, and transportation uh, is really uh, growing about four or five fold, uh, and, and of course for building heat and power. And for Norway, this means that you know, there are definitely areas in here that are more suitable for domestic use of hydrogen uh, that's produced domestically, for example, in transportation and industry. Uh, but whereas for building heat and power, so Norway uh, runs almost entirely on electric heat and heat pumps, uh, any uh, hydrogen used for building heat and power will, will need to be exported. Okay, so a few examples of how this picture is starting to play out. Um, there are already a couple projects and concepts and technologies that are being developed for domestic hydrogen use and production and use, mainly to uh, decarbonize uh, the both oil and gas industry, uh, but also coastal traffic and, and other types of power needs that are more remote. Uh, so this is a, um, a, pro a project that's uh, being developed by Technip FMC that uses wind power uh, and integrated hydrogen production with storage on, on the sea bottom. Uh, Blue-green hydrogen could also be a part of the offshore power energy mix with CCS, and this is a, a schematic of how that might look like, uh, where you have sort of a multiple use of the subsurface uh, to enable uh, electrification, or at least green, clean energy um, power to offshore installations. The other big aspect is really 
uh, stranded assets. So there are a lot of gas assets, assets in the Barents Sea, uh, and right now there's a new project coming online that's also partly supported by Equinor uh, that is uh, going to produce ammonia uh, from natural gas with CCS, and that will be shipped uh, to, uh, for export. Um, but this direct export of blue hydrogen is still unclear to me, and again, it comes back to the scales and how fast we can ramp up. Uh, so that is, uh, but there's still quite a lot, despite all of that uncertainty going on domestically. Okay, how does this all, what does this mean for offshore energy hub, uh, or hubs, or how many hubs? I just want to point to some work that's been done now for the past few years uh, by TNO in the Netherlands, called the North Sea Energy R&D Program. And uh, the Netherlands, of course, is, I think, quite uh, on the forefront of this type of concept, where they place a lot of energy production offshore. Um, and Netherlands, of course, is a very small country, land area-wise, Norway's population-wise. Um, and that frees up land space uh, and allows these types of offshore energy island, energy, not energy islands anyway, offshore energy hubs uh, to be integrated into the larger uh, regional uh, energy system. Now, of course, a lot of work goes into this understanding how you integrate different energy sources uh, with CCS and natural gas into a single offshore environment, um, but there's definitely a growing popularity uh, for this concept um, in, in, in countries like the Netherlands. It's very much a function of what you're supplying energy towards, and an en energy-hungry nation like the Netherlands uh, certainly will have a different perspective on this than, than Norway, uh, and you really need to look at how you want to balance imports and exports, uh, and what are the, real, the basically the techno-economics that make this go uh, around. Is this a model for Norway? And of course, there will have to be adjustments when thinking about what an energy hub will look like, especially when it comes to hydrogen production. Um, offshore hydrogen production is expensive uh, for Norway, and it might be more sense to do onshore. Um, but right now, of course, there's a lot of activity. We mentioned Trollwind on, on developing these offshore clean power concepts, uh, both the Trollwind uh, uh, and also uh, how we power uh, offshore installations through a collective energy hub. Uh, and there are definitely concepts coming out. Uh, this is called Blue Stream, which is a uh, offshore gas turbine with CCS that would uh, allow the offshore installations to connect to, to clean energy. And uh, up and coming are other types of ways of facilitating offshore clean energy. None of this right now involves hydrogen, but the idea is that once you've established some sort of offshore uh, energy system, it would be uh, easier to step out from there. Okay, so back again to hydrogen, <laughs> blue and green hydrogen and there's turquoise, and there's pink, and there's five different variants of green hydrogen, uh, and a lot of them involve CO2 uh, for storage, CCS, including green hydrogen production from biomass and biogas, and the, po the point of this is to say that it's not as simple as what's blue and what's green at the end of the day, it's all hydrogen <laughs> uh, uh, that will be emissions low carbon, uh, except for this one down here. Uh, so uh, just wanted to have that uh, in the back of our minds. But what I wanted to say more about hydrogen is that the power to gas, and that's the, the buzzword, is, is really the, the power of hydrogen uh, and what it can do for the economy is de decoupling renewable energy generation from energy demand. Uh, this is a, a very nice schematic out of the uh, International Renewable Energy Agency showing you how you, you move from the primary uh, electricity source uh, to actually providing uh, the end users with a fuel uh, of, that, that can be used when they want it, not when it's produced. All this is dependent on some form of energy storage, uh, both at the short and, and long-term scales, at docks, at filling stations, in cities, in industrial areas, and that's really where the, the, the bottlenecks are now, is being able to develop the kind of flexibility in the transportation and storage that's really needed to facilitate this type of picture. And typically, hydrogen has been produced very close to the end users or by the end users themselves. Some of that's due to safety. I haven't, I'm not going to say anything more about that, but safety uh, and, the, and the combustibility of hydrogen is a, is a big issue. There are material issues to, 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 to solve. Um, there's embrittlement, embrittlement 
uh, the hydrogen has a, uh, 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 needs to be addressed at least and it adds additional costs. Hydrogen has a very low energy density, so you need larger volumes to transport and store. And all this is, is not unsolvable, but it's a, it's, a, it's a factor that we need to remember, and it probably will cost something. Um, as an underground <laughs> person, uh, I can't talk about hydrogen without talking about underground gas storage. Gas storage is not a new concept. Uh, we have seasonal gas storage in Europe uh, up to and one and a half terawatt hours, which accounts to about 25 to 30 percent of total gas consumption in Europe. Um, hydrogen can be a substitute for natural gas in this storage, and this is showing you um, monthly gas supply balance in Europe. Uh, this is from uh, going back to 2014 to 2021, and the bumps here are the the supply of gas to Europe from the store from the storage. Um, so it, it's 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 something that is already part of the supply mix. Um, and if you're going to substitute blue hydrogen here, then you also need to have a equi an equivalent, <laughs> but some appropriate amount of permanent storage available for CO2 to fill those uh, storage, um, gas storage facilities with, with hydrogen. This is just giving you a, a picture of how extensive the underground gas storage network is in Europe. Um, and as I've mentioned already, all of Norway's gas exports are used for home heating and cooking, uh, so a lot of Norwegian gas goes into these stores, um, and it's a really essential component. There's just some numbers, uh, but the point of this picture is to say that, again, these dots aren't actually the true land area size of the, of the stores, but their uh, relative size gives you the relative um, um, size of the stores. But the point is that the energy density of hydrogen, as I mentioned, is about a quarter of that of methane. So if we are to replace all of these stores with hydrogen, we need four times the capacity. Uh, so we need to develop new areas uh, if this were to be uh, the way to go. It may not be uh, how we end up, a future hydrogen distribution network um, and the need for the scale of under underground storage is less likely uh, if home heating is to be eventually electrified. Uh, but it is um, something that's on the radar, and there's quite a lot of work going in now into understanding how we can accelerate uh, the development of uh, hydrogen storage as, as one, of the, um, one of the options here. This is a very busy slide, um, a paper that will very soon be, be published, trying to give you a, a sense of, so underground storage is not new. Underground gas storage has been around for decades. CO2 storage is now mature technology with 25 years uh, of experience under the belt. And so we already know quite a lot, uh, have solved a lot of technical and engineering issues, um, both on the top side between monitoring and reporting, down in the storage integrity and, and all the facilities and everything in between. And what does hydrogen really bring here uh, that is new that we need to look at? One is microbial contamination and the, um, the, f the feedstock <laughs> for bugs in the subsurface needs to be understood so it can be managed so we don't lose energy uh, in, the, in the storage process. Uh, and the other thing that's actually not on this picture are public acceptance issues. This is something CO2 storage has had to deal with that natural gas storage never had to deal with. If natural gas storage would be developed as technology today, it would probably have to deal with these types of, uh, of societal issues. Society needs to be engaged early uh, and, and eagerly if underground storage is to succeed for hydrogen. Ooh, S. Okay, so the need for research... Ooh, went too far. Uh, the blue shows uh, along the, oh gosh, I thought I'd be expert at this by now, uh, transport, storage, metering, pressure reg regulation, distribution, utilization, every aspect here needs some type of research. The blue here is research needed. Yellow is, yeah, probably if we just do some technical checks, and green is good to go. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And it doesn't mean that's not solvable, but we do need to start if by 2050 hydrogen is to be where it's going to be. And just a bit of uh, advertising for a couple of centers that have, and, and Sintef and Norse both awarded uh, two new research centers, environmental friendly energy within hydrogen. And to give you a sense of 
the breadth and scope, just to look at the number of research partners and industry partners that are interested in it. This is an extreme, extremely engaging topic. Uh, there's a lot going on both at Norris and Sintev and all around Norway. Uh, so we've received the charge from the government and we will do the best we can to address everything uh, that we can possibly do within the next few years to help uh, speed up uh, the, the, the development and implementation of hydrogen technology. And the same goes for uh, the, uh, the offshore of how hydrogen works within the subsurface as part of the total solution uh, to achieve offshore emissions to zero. So with that, I would uh, just sum up with a few thoughts I had kind of on the plane over. You know, we have a, very, a lot of ambitions both in Norway and Europe, uh, and there are many things emerging, but I think having worked in CO2 storage for many years, it was really the public investment and the, and the, and the collaboration between industry that I would say kicked off uh, a true business for CO2 and CCS. And I'm still curious how this will play out for hydrogen, um, who will be the first movers, how, will, how can we uh, smartly invest public money to get these value chains up and running. Um, and the last thing I would like to say is that yeah, the role of the subsurface and the technical challenges, it's still far from certain, uh, but, uh, but we, do, we do need to start to address them so that we can uh, be repaired when the time comes. So I'd just like to thank funding from the center I lead, Center for Sustainable Subsurface Resources, and hope maybe there's time for a couple of questions. Hmm. Well, just one small question. You mentioned that uh, wind, uh, offshore wind is expensive, so you, you, you meant uh, in, in, uh, in your uh, statement that uh, you... Um, you prefer onshore wind? Onshore hydrogen production. I'm yeah. sorry if I misspoke. Okay. Yeah, offshore hydrogen production, I think there was actually an, an, a case study done by Sintef, at least for Norway, uh, mm. and this was prior to the current energy crisis, uh, that it was cheaper to produce hydrogen onshore uh, and send it out uh, by ship or pipeline to offshore installations if you're going to use it to fire, for example, mm. turbines with hydrogen. Mm. No, I didn't mean to say wind. Mm. Uh, I meant to say hydrogen. So okay. offshore hydrogen production is more expensive, yeah. at least at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have time for one question, if there is? Uh, one short question. Do you see a potential? I see that Australia is starting to develop uh, hydrogen from solar panels. Yes. Is that realistic to compete or to transport from the, let's say, solar areas in the Middle East and Australia. Is that a, is there a realistic competition between what we're talking about and the import from hydrogen from these areas? I mean, I don't think Australia will ever be exporting hydrogen to Europe. That's mainly export to Asia. And, and they want to make value of their coal. So from what I recall, and I actually was not that long ago, that they're, yeah, they use sol, solar, um, which they have abundance of and is cheaper. Uh, so I think every country and every market has a different uh, mix of what they're going to end up. And Australia is looking to, to Asia, but again, the end users aren't there yet. And maybe it's, they start with Japan. Uh, Japan is quite the hydrogen pro, pro hydrogen. Uh, but uh, yeah, they're looking for a, the Asian market. And the Middle East. Oh, the Middle East. I don't. I can't say anything <laughs> about that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Anders. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Next speaker is from NVE, the Norwegian uh, Energy System, the Norwegian Water Resources and Energy Directorate in English. <laughs> Anna T. Brunvold, you are going to talk about the Norwegian Energy System towards 2050. Floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's better to speak here. Um, um, thank you for inviting me to, um, to talk about the Norwegian energy system towards 2050 and the importance of offshore wind. So um, this is an important topic for NVE, uh, being um, in my section especially, to how to handle this enormous amount of wind power and new production into the grid in Norway. So we have several uh, projects going on and uh, also uh, 
assignments from the government to see to see how much um, how much is possible uh, in analysis and also in regulations. So I'm going to talk you through some of these uh, in my presentation today. Um, let me find, yeah. But the first uh, one thing that is important to mention is uh, the energy balance and why is that? And that is uh, basically because offshore wind is good towards the energy balance uh, because it uh, will improve that. And um, we have made these analyses and uh, it might be a bit complex, this PowerPoint, but uh, your, uh, most of your researches, so you'll probably see it quite easily when I explain it. But as you can see, um, um, uh, <coughs> all these uh, in Norway, the difference between a dry year and a wet year is 60 terawatt hour, and the average production is 140 terawatt hour. So these dots illustrate each weather year, as we call it. And uh, up to now, uh, when Norway has historically had a, 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 um, a surplus of energy in the energy balance, and we have exported approximately 20 terawatt hour every year. But what we see now forward going is that this is declining due to all the new production that's coming into the uh, energy system. And here we have done an analysis and seen on uh, what if the uh, uh, if we have a high energy balance, which means that the, uh, we export 19 ter terawatt hours, or if we have a low um, energy ba balance, which means we are, have to import energy to Norway. And then we can see that um, all the green dots are below the prices, uh, the electricity prices in Germany and in the UK, while if we go to have to import uh, electricity to Norway, the, uh, we are going to have energy prices as high as in, in the UK. Um, this uh, here is also done with gas prices as uh, illustrative to now, because the one thing that we can see also is that the, uh, the prices are pretty high here, and that is because that's the one dominant uh, uh, factor of the energy prices in Norway. So, but the main message is that offshore wind and more renewable uh, uh, energy into Norway is very good because then we will get lower energy prices and mainly it will be lower than at the, at the continent. So what's the status of offshore wind in uh, Norway today? Um, and we, we have been working with offshore wind uh, and we started in 2010 doing, uh, and then we published um, uh, um, a re report uh, in which fi 15 areas why were identified as possible areas for offshore wind. And uh, we did also an assessment of these 15 areas, and that was presented in 2012. And uh, in uh, the, this map was also published in 2012, and it identified these 15 areas that are suitable for offshore wind, as we said uh, then. And uh, you can see all the names of these areas in the uh, uh, listed up over here. And two. Uh, of these areas were opened for wind power in 2020. It's Utsira North and Sørlige Nordsjø 2. Utsira North has an average, average depth of 265 meters, suitable for floating wind power, and the amount that it could, we estimated then, that it could uh, provide is 1,500 megawatts, while Sørlige Nordsjø 2 could provide 3,000 megawatts. Phase one in Sørlige Nordsjø 2 is 1,500 megawatts, while uh, phase two is 1,500 megawatts, as it is granted uh, today. So, in NVE, we have then been giving three assignments from the government to work to see uh, which we are working on currently. The regulator is working on one, is, and that is to evaluate the regulatory framework towards what kind of uh, grid solutions sh should we have for offshore wind power. And then we have one uh, assignment where we work on uh, how um, different grid solutions will affect the Norwegian energy system. How, what is different kind of, uh, if we had a, a radial direct into Norway or a hybrid solution, how would that affect the Norwegian grid system? This, we're going to uh, publish the result uh, in January. So unfortunately, we will not talk about then, that one. But I will go a bit into the depth, the dip, depth for the th uh, third one, and that is to identify new areas for offshore wind uh, in Norway. 
and um, uh, he, the, uh, this one we're working on currently. And one of the first um, uh, projects we do is to reassi is a reassignment of the areas from uh, 2012 and to in investigate whether it is possible to increase uh, the capacity of the already opened areas uh, in Sørland Norge 2 and Utsira Nord. And we should also identify entirely new areas for uh, offshore wind and a development a program for impact assessment of the identified areas. And the aim is, as I said before, to uh, find offshore wind as corresponding to 30 gigawatt in, in Norway. Um, so the method we use is a GIS-based um, decision tool, and it's the same tool that was applied in 2010, um, and it has been developed by the Crown Estate and the Great Britain. And what we do is we collect data from different direct routes and uh, sources and, uh, and run this through an GIS analysis. This results in two different maps. One map that you can find the most suitable areas for offshore wind based on physical parameters, uh, like water dip, uh, depth, wi wind resources, distance to land, uh, etc. And another map showing what kind of areas will there be lots of conflicts and conflicts of interest such as fisheries, oil, uh, gas, environmental data, etc., etc. And this data, uh, map is currently being developed, and um, a first version will be uh, published on our homepage very soon. Um, and these two maps will be combined to find the areas most suitable for offshore wind production. And you can, at the map you see, you can see some small hints of uh, this uh, work that will soon be uh, released. Um, so, uh, how big much area is needed for 30 gigawatt? Um, um, well you as you can see, uh, the areas are uh, illustrated on uh, here, uh, and they're quite similar to those uh, Simon uh, showed in the presentation in the beginning. It's, uh, but if you say you have an area, uh, some capacity factors, this uh, will be the area. But we have to take into account that uh, uh, we have several, you have to have some areas for protection areas and you have to have different kind of, uh, you, you have yeah, different kinds of, uh, you have to take some allowance into the consideration. So um, we, when we present the map, we'll assume a man, an average development capacity factor of five giga, giga, gigawatt, megawatt, and, and utilization rate at approximately 40 to 50 uh, percent. So uh, this is uh, working, and we have a homepage at NV, which we publish the thing uh, regularly when we come with new updates. So that could be an interesting place to follow. So uh, this is what we're working on as it is. But I was asked to talk about uh, uh, offshore wind in Norway toward 2050, and that's a bit uh, more difficult a topic. But I have some, um, I brought some uh, points. And uh, as I've shown you now, I've shown you a map of several uh, places. But as you can also see, that troll wind, for instance, that's here, is not on one, any of the maps or any of the identified areas as it is. So these, uh, I'm talking about two things now. This ma map is showing all the areas where we are, where, which is planned for offshore wind. Uh, and you can see that all these 15 areas are also included in that map. So these are kind of the official maps which is uh, out there and um, how much capacity and where is it planned to be built offshore wind in the North Sea uh, area. Um, and, um, but what's happening with the plants? Um, that's uh, also uh, uh, interesting to see. Um, as you can see on this um, um, map here uh, that are offshore wind ambitions for 15 countries which has target 2030 type targets. And um, uh, the targets for installed capacity in 2030 are presented in green, uh, while the blue bars uh, show the forecasted capacity and the purple bars are showing the current capacity. And um, you might see in yellow marked that uh, there are three countries, Poland, uh, Vietnam and Denmark, are forecasted to complete their 2030 ambitions. While, uh, like uh, for instance, uh, 
the UK, Netherlands and, and US are short of the 2030 ambitions, but they're not that far behind. So, but this is a kind of a good status. But what's actually going to happen, we don't know. Uh, for instance, Tolwin is a project that just flies in from another co uh, kind of corner. And, uh, but it's a very interesting project. It has, uh, it's, uh, as far as I, we know, uh, the largest uh, floating uh, offshore wind project, approximately 4.3 terawatt hour, one gigawatt. And uh, it's Equinor and several partners that has launched and talked about it in public from in, uh, in June uh, 22. And it's planned to be oper in operation in somewhere in between 20, uh, 2027, 2028, depending on permission rates from the government. And I must state that NVE we has not looked into if it's, po if it's possible to, to all license the processes and anything. What we got an assignment of was to evaluate, is this a good project for the energy system in Norway? That was we, what we were asked to do. And we did. And uh, Kolsnes is Helicoaster's uh, located west for Bergen. And has a, that is an area where there's a lack of energy uh, a lot. There's a huge production. So the max con uh, consumption in there, this area is 2,300 megawatts. And a lot of this production is out on the coastline. So when you do grid analysis, you can see that uh, the power uh, it goes from, from uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> out to the west. And there's a lot of new production uh, uh, consumption that's coming into Colsnes as well. So uh, this area need more production. So what NVE concluded with this autumn uh, is that um, um, <coughs> uh, the uh, troll wind uh, will have an immediately uh, and favorable uh, effect on the power situation uh, and security of supply in uh, Kolsnes, and especially in the period between 2027 and 2030. And it will also uh, considerably reduce the probability of using system production system, it, it, which means that it will increase the security of the supply in this period as well. So, um, but as I said, in the licenses processes areas, everything is not looked into uh, 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 at yet. But as I also said, that it is, will reduce the need of system, uh, production system, but it will not take it away. So that's a very important topic as well when we talk about uh, uh, offshore wind. And then we have to look into the power balance. Uh, and uh, NVE has recently re uh, um, uh, launched a report called, uh, uh, where we said that, as we can see, we will have a poverty uh, challenge in the future because lots of the goals, uh, make, uh, of the climate goals, makes that we have much more consumption of electricity and um, all the new production are mostly intermittent. So, um, uh, <coughs> the one point that is very important to mention, as I showed you the North Sea ba Basin, is that n the Nordic uh, have already a decif uh, decif power deficit today, which means that uh, uh, if you take a um, available power, it refers to the production capacity available to cover peak demand in a given hour at the highest uh, hourly consumption. And that will normally be during a cold winter day in, uh, in Norway due to that we have heating and uh, electricity for heating. And that means that those kind of days, it will, the, it will be the, when we actually need and must be, have some reliable energy production. And you cannot say that wind power is reliable to, to solve that issue that specific day. So, uh, so what's happening in the Nordic countries are that we have already a power deficit, uh, deficit and this will be um, uh, will increase. And this is due to that the consumption will grow with six gigawatt, while the reliable uh, um, power production will decline with one gigawatt. So the power deficit will increase in this uh, period. Uh, so. Uh, and one thing that also very important to mention, that we get this more weather-dependent power system, and that can, can lead to power uh, so, uh, so shortages in many countries at the same time. 
due to that there is a large overlap of wind power production in the Nordic countries as seen on this uh, uh, illustration here. And um, uh, there might be, so as it is today, every country will rely on other countries to have enough power supply. And what all these Nordic countries are relying on today is Norway and Nor Norway's hydropower. But in somewhere in between 20, 27, 2030, we will no longer have a surplus in Norway. So then we also have this deficit. So th then we need some other issues to uh, solve this. So the point there is that offshore wind is not enough on its own. So we need so, uh, some measures to make us less vulnerable. And I, has, and I have already said, but we need to build some more hydropower that could balance the system and also need balancing services. And we also need to have more energy efficiency because we, uh, the, uh, we, we use much more energy when we use electricity for heating. And if we could take down those uh, peaks and those tops, it will help. And we also no need better grid capacity to be able to, ex uh, to transport from one price area to another price area. And we need more collaborations in the Nordic between the grid and how to develop the North Sea Basin and so, so on. And we also need more um, better knowledge and more analysis on how, how to how to solve these rapid changes in the grid system uh, in a pace that we have never seen before. Thank you. Thank you very much. We receive a lot of information uh, today, <laughs> <laughs> I must admit. <laughs> I can hardly speak any faster, so... so. Uh, uh, the last topic you mentioned, uh, the deficit of energy and power. Uh, one question which has been uh, on the news, so to speak, is uh, how does the cooperation between Sweden, Norway, and uh, within those countries uh, work? There has been a news with a more or less negative uh, con connotation there, isn't it? No, but I, I would say that the Nordic country works... Uh, uh, actually, it, anywhere, anywhere it could be some kind of uh, um, friction. But mm. the, uh, the basic, we have one grid, uh, integrated system mm. and one market so uh, so that's um, but there are you, you can see things like in Germany and uh, other uh, mm. areas so it's um, but it will be it is a very interesting que question if we dare to rely on each other all the time uh, during these times to be import when we need and then uh, hydrogen as we talked about to be able to be have some kind of balance and um, to the system will be very uh, very political issues in the future to think about mm. uh, so that each country uh, does not necessarily work towards an aim to be self-sufficient on its own is that part of this, this the, the, the discussion yeah uh, because being self-sufficient on its own is probably much more expensive than mm. if we manage to not go into that direction um, but um, with times with war, it's hard to predict what the politicians choose and mm. uh, what we l would like. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Mm. Uh, next uh, speaker, Jon Olav Tande from Sintef Research Institute in Trondheim. Also on uh, the same topic, offshore wind and uh, future renewable energy system. The floor is yours. Thank you. Ah, there it is. Um, I will speak about offshore wind and the future renewable energy system. And uh, I will start with sort of 
If you're into offshore wind, maybe this is a bit of a turn-off because you see uh, this is wind energy in strong growth and then you see offshore is quite small compared to land-based wind. And, uh, and then why do I start with this? Some noise. Hope it works. Okay, uh, the interesting thing about this graph is to see the tremendous growth we have had uh, for 20 years in land based wind. It has increased from less than 50 gigawatt to almost 900 gigawatts. And now, today, we have, well, more or less 50 gigawatt offshore wind. In 2020, we had 30 gigawatt offshore wind. It was 20 gigawatt extra during 2021. So this growth is exponential. And it, my prediction is that it will follow this graph. So that means in 20 years, in 2042, 2043 sometime, we may have 900 gigawatts of offshore wind. And why do I predict that? Well, it's not only me that predict that. There's a lot of uh, the International Energy, Com uh, Energy uh, Agency, uh, other companies are doing forecasts, and most of them predict that offshore wind will be a big thing. It has a big potential. And why is that? Well, if you look at the energy need, we need more energy, we need to phase out coal, we need to replace it with renewables. Wind will be a big part of that, together with solar, hydro, power, and so on. <clears throat> but wind will be big. But land is limited, and most of the surface on land is at sea, so therefore offshore wind has a big uh, potential. And actually, if you look at current plans for Europe, in 2050, Europe uh, will have one-third of its electricity supply from offshore wind. And that's not one-third of the electricity supply today, it's one-third of the electricity supply in 2050, which will be much higher than it is today because of the electrification of the community. And just looking at what happens outside here in the North Sea, well, Norway has plans of 30 gigawatts, the UK has a plan of 100 uh, gigawatts by 2050. Denmark, Belgium, Germany, and the Netherlands together has a plan of 150 gigawatt. And not on this map, but still, Sweden uh, and Denmark together has a plan of 90 gigawatt. And all this by 2050. So just in this area here, well, there may be some offshore wind also further up north, but in this area, we're looking at something like 300 gigawatts by, by 2050. And then you'll have the rest of the world, so this is a huge uh, development and what I call an ocean of opportunities. If you look at the 30 gigawatt of offshore wind that will be installed in Norway by 2050, that is a doubling of the Norwegian power system that we have today. And I'd, I'd like to say this is a tremendous challenge. We're going to build a new power system at sea with the sort of same size or generation capacity as we have today. And the system we have today, we have developed over 120 years. Now we're going to do the same in 20, 30 years. And we're going to do it offshore. And this also with the link to Europe, with large generation offshore wind in Europe, together with uh, PV and other variable renewables, we look at a totally new power system operation. At the same time, this is uh, good in the sense that it's the only way forward to fight climate change. It is a big opportunity for the industry, both to have supply of uh, electricity at a reasonable cost. It is will be a sustainable energy system, and it's a big opportunity for the industry to supply uh, goods and services for building this. 
And of course, then there is a strong need for new knowledge, innovation, and competence to reach these goals and to, to develop this system in a good way. It's a trillion euro business. That's actually what we're talking about. If you look at the European energy system and just the installation of offshore wind in Europe, by 2050, we will in have installed more or less a trillion euro uh, by that time. Uh, and in comparison, in Norway, we will install about a trillion Norwegian kroner. Uh, we invest in about a trillion Norwegian kroner. That's the size of it. I don't think... I'm not sure always that the politicians realize the challenges when they sort of set these goals and, and, and put the right measures to reach the goals. Therefore, I'm very happy to hear, for instance, uh, presentations uh, earlier today, for instance, from Equinor talking about, okay, what shall we achieve by 2035? But to push from there and, and go on, that's, that's important. So, uh, Offshore wind today, if we talk about uh, bottom fixed turbines, they are able to deliver affordable generation. An affordable generation is, for instance, at Doggy Bank at uh, something like uh, 40, this is uh, um, British pounds per megawatt hour, more or less 50 euro per kilowatt hour. So that's uh, what I would say affordable. And they use these uh, big turbines. Just a fun fact here. Uh, this, this is one of the biggest turbines in the world. Uh, but they are getting bigger every day. So by 2050, maybe we have 20 or 30 giga megawatt turbines. Uh, but one rotation of this uh, turbine, if it's a good win, it will generate uh, enough electricity to supply a house for how many hours, do you think? Actually, uh, two days if it is a UK house. Tells you something about the scale. Uh, floating wind, I believe, also have a, a very high potential. And that's because, well, again, if you look at the ocean, most of the area at the ocean is at deep sea. And I define deep sea as more than 60, 70 meters. And if you have more than 60, 70 meters of, the, of water depth, well, then you have to install floating turbines. Not fixed to the seabed, but, but floating. And IEA, the International Energy, Energy Agency, they have done a study on the potential for, for offshore wind both uh, bottom fixed and, uh, and floating, and they say 80% of the resource is floating. And they haven't looked on the whole sea, they have just looked on a, a, a small area close to the land, actually. So floating wind is an important technology, but it is at an early stage of development. In the graph I showed you, where you saw offshore wind and about 50 gigawatt, uh, Floating wind is uh, much less than a gigawatt. It's a sort of 0.1 gigawatt or something today. So it's a niche of niche energy technology, but with a huge potential. And the reason I, I say it has a huge potential is again because of the area and the potential to install floating wind. It's also because you can do it when you have large areas at uh, disposal, you can find the places where it's best to install them also with regards to other interests like fishing or not to disturb uh, sea life or birds or, or what have you. And then, of course, it's more expensive than bottom fixed, but that can be, that's quite natural since this is a new uh, technology. And uh, you can reduce the cost uh, mainly by upscaling. You see here an example of, of the high wind turbines. First one was installed in 2009 outside Norway, first globally first floating wind turbine. Uh, 2.3 megawatt, 85 meter rotor diameter, 
a fairly big floater compared to uh, Hive in uh, Scotland, if you look there, but then six megawatts, so three times the size or two times the size of the rotary area, and the floater is, well, at least comparable. So you save cost by upscaling. And then if you go to Hive in Tampen, you also see an even bigger turbine, not very much larger floater, and this one is built in concrete, which is cheaper than steel. So again, cutting cost. And then of course, uh, there are people out there that uh, sort of speculate, do wind turbines have to do look always like this? Or can they be uh, looking like this, for instance, uh, floating, floating like this, tilted, and with two rotors, one rotating that way, another one rotating that way. Um, that has some benefits because you then, then get, don't get any torsional torque down here, so keep it stable in the water. Maybe that can be something for 2050, who knows? There are lots of possibilities to reduce the cost of floating wind through research, innovation and, and deployment. So knowledge plus industry is uh, dollars, 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 or value creation. It's important. And we work together with industry in this new center, FME Northwind. I'm very happy to have, uh, have that. It was funded by the Research Council of Norway together with 50 industry partners. So 50 industry partners from Norway is, is collaborating this center. And, and we do research here to to uh, reduce cost of wind energy, facilitate its sustainable development, create jobs and grow exports. And we have 30 innovations in development. And I will not have time to go through all of them, of course, but I will just mention that these innovations are within structures and integrity, in marine operations and logistics, in electrical infrastructure and system integration, in digital twin technology and asset management, and also very important on sustainable uh, wind development. Uh, we must make sure that we don't solve the sort of energy crisis or climate crisis and at the same time do not take care of nature. So we need to do it all. And the future requires new energy solutions. Uh, this picture here is from EnergyNet, together with Gus Juni and Tenet. Uh, EnergyNet and Tenet are two uh, system operators like uh, Startnet, big system operators, and they are planning this, this offshore grid. This is just an artist's impression, but it is an offshore grid in the future with these uh, offshore islands or nodes where you connect both uh, hydrogen production and electricity production and you transport both hydrogen and, and electricity in this uh, grid. And uh, Denmark and, and the Netherlands and Germany are going ahead with these plans. Denmark is going to develop these energy islands. So one will be at Bornholm and another one will be an artificial island uh, in the North Sea. Uh, and that is instead of having these uh, platforms like this uh, to connect offshore wind farms. So this is a platform, uh, more or less a one gigawatt or thousand megawatt uh, platform. Uh, the size of this is like a football field. It is uh, 100 meter long, 70 meter wide, if I remember correctly, and more or less uh, 70 meter uh, tall. So it's a huge construction. And you wonder, is that, if you, that's one gigawatt? In Norway, we need 30 gigawatts, we need 30 such platforms to connect the offshore wind farms, offshore. And in the North Sea, we're talking about 300 gigawatts of offshore wind, so you would need 300 of such uh, football fields in the North Sea. It's, it's sort of a bit, is that the way to go forward? No, maybe, yes, I wouldn't abandon this. There will be platforms like this, but you also need bigger islands like this, uh, you need a combination, and maybe also you need uh, subsea technology. 
so you can put the platforms at the seabed. Because if you develop floating wind turbines and they are at uh, 300, water, 300 meter water depth, you don't want to install a platform like this being fixed to the seabed. Then you need to have a uh, subsea technology. And here again, we, uh, we can build on experience from oil and gas, and we can uh, do this better, and that's what we are working on in, in, uh, in Northwind and also in spin-off projects. Trollwind has already been uh, mentioned several times. That's a really exciting project to connect uh, oil and gas field uh, to an offshore wind farm and also have power to shore. Um, and we have studied not, and I think, yeah, I should go back to that. I think that this is very important for Norway if we want to accelerate the development of offshore wind that we use these kind of electrification projects as a stepping stone. Because we have this 30 gigawatt coal, and that shall be delivered by 2050, more or less. Uh, we cannot start saying, oh, you should do everything between 2040 and 2050. We need to have uh, these employees quite soon, and we need, to, we need to ramp up, and this can be built quite quickly. There is a need for the electricity, the technology is there, uh, it's a good idea, uh, and it can be done already before 2030. That would be great. So, but what would happen if we build this 30 gigawatt offshore wind? That's one of the questions we've been asking ourselves in, in Northwind. And, uh, of course, we don't know where the wind farms will be built, so we just took the map from uh, NVE uh, with these 15 sites and said, OK, let's assume that the 30 gigawatts of offshore wind is built at these 15 sites. And then we looked at 29 years of data, hourly data on wind speed, uh, and said, OK, how is the wind uh, varying from hour to hour over these 29 years? And can we use that to say something about how the system in the future will operate? And one of the important findings we, we found was that uh, there is very little correlation between production in north of Norway and, and south of Norway. So uh, this is uh, site zero, that's south and north sea here. Uh, 14, that's all the way up in the north. And then we also took a comparison with Dagebank, Hunsrev, and, and Baltic II in Germany. So Germany, Denmark, UK, and looked how it compares with that. And we see, well, Southern part of North Sea and Dagebank, they're fairly correlated, but not, not one. So there is some, some variation there also. But a good thing, really good thing, is that there is, and I think Arne also showed that, there is a, two different wind regimes, one in the north and one in the south, and that's really good. Another good thing is that it blows more in the winter than in the summer. And if you know the hydropower, it comes with an inflow like this, mostly during the spring and the summer when it rains, and very little during the winter. So that's good because that means offshore wind or wind in general in Norway will come in the opposite phase of the hydro inflow, but it will become more or less in phase with electricity consumption because the electricity consumption is higher in the winter and and lower in the, in, the, in the summer. But of course, there will be variations from week to week. This is the standard deviation. So there will be more need for shorter uh, term energy storage. But there is a lot of flexibility in this energy system that we haven't used today. Water heaters, for instance, that can be turned on and off without any lack of uh, comfort for users. Electric car charging can be used uh, for flexibility. You have process plants that can be used for uh, flexibility. And of course you have hydrogen. But there are lots of uh, possibilities for flexibility that we haven't used in yet. And then I will just uh, round up with the final slide showing the future grid. 
uh, there are lots of pictures like this, and nobody knows how the future grid will look like. But this is uh, sort of one guess, and it's based on plans for offshore wind farms. Of course, we don't know where the offshore wind farms in Norway will come, but what we do suggest would be a good idea to investigate is, since we have these two different wind regimes, northern Norway and, and southern Norway, well, something tells me that if it blows here a lot and you have lots of offshore wind plants here, the electricity price will be low when it blows here. And then there is a probability that there is higher wind here, which then will have a higher value if it can be transported down south. Currently in Norway, the electricity uh, transmission capacity between southern Norway and, and mid-Norway north is a few hundred megawatts. So it's point something gigawatt. And it's very difficult to increase that transmission capacity because you have this monster mast uh, discussions and everything. But you could maybe build an offshore connection like this. And I know this sounds a bit uh, sort of science fiction today, but I remind uh, when we built, or yeah, Equinor built uh, high wind, uh, the first high wind turbine, that was also really science fiction. What, a floating turbine? Now that is technology that is very sought after, and in 2050 it will be mainstream technology, I'm quite sure. And in 2050 maybe we look at this map and say, okay, of course. So, just a reminder about this one. It's a good place if you are interested in offshore wind, and, and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will meet you again in the panel discussion, so I think we go no. straight yeah, to the next uh, presenter from Havforskningens Institute, the Norwegian Marine uh, Institute of Marine Research. Nils Gunnar Kvamste, the environmental challenges of offshore wind and renewables. Floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, do you hear me? Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this um, <coughs> seminar and to giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, a very important uh, topic that in my mind has the potential to contribute to several of the global challenges that we face today. So, uh, yes, my name is Nils Gunnar Kvamstø. I'm CEO at the Norwegian Institute of Marine Research. And uh, the Marine Research um, <coughs> Institute of Marine Research, we are a national research institution. And our main kind of deliverables is knowledge-based advice. So, um, our... Um, uh, there, sorry. So our value chain is um, we monitor the oceans, both physically and, and also the ecosystem. And then we do research and we give knowledge-based advice to, um, uh, to, uh, to policymakers and, and marine industry. And the, um, so the, 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 our activity can be stratified under, under these um, headlines ecosystem and impact, sustainable harvest, sustainable aquaculture, and safe and healthy seafood. So I will talk about um, <clears throat> offshore wind from the point of view of, of marine ecosystems. Um, and I will try to structure my talk like this. I will try to say something about wind farms or offshore wind from a global warming perspective. And I will briefly try to say something about what do we know about the effects of wind farms today and which research topics are important to explore further to, to advance with these plans and how to communicate the knowledge to policymakers. And finally, uh, a little bit about the possibility of expanding or developing offshore wind industry as a mitigation, mitigating measure or emission-reducing measure. Um, <clears throat> yes, the um, global, warming, global warming perspective. Here you see a figure that shows 
how we, uh, or a scenario of the temperature at two meter depths outside the region of the Western Norway, how that will develop um, in the future. And you see three different curves. The red one is <coughs> what we call the business as usual scenario. Um, then the pink one, which is uh, a, a little bit more moderate scenario, 4.5, which that, that corresponds to a doubling, approximately a doubling of the CO2 concentration at the end of the century. And then there is a moderate, uh, much more moderate and optimistic scenario, the blue, which is the blue curve here. So <coughs> these scenarios has been, um, or have been uh, computed by downscale, dynamically downscaling global scenarios from IPCC CMIP-6. Uh, and what I will show you now is um, what we think are going to be some of the effects um, of, this, of the climate effect on the marine ecosystems from the period, in the period from 2020 and until 2041. So it's in the beginning of this phase. We have not removed natural variability, but, uh, <coughs> but the signal is there, as you can see, and we have done this for all the uh, Norwegian areas, so there is a lot of time series involved. So, so to some extent, also the natural variability will be kind of masked in the results. But here on the right, you see um, a figure that kind of sums up some of the effects that the climate, some of the climate's effects on the marine ecosystem. We have a range of different, different ecosystem components or species along the x-axis. And then these species on the left, they are mostly in the North Sea. The species here in the middle, they are in the Norwegian Sea. And then you have the Barents Sea species on the right. So this also denotes how the regions will develop, ecosystem-wise. And then we have four different panels. This, is the, this shows the directional effect of the climate accumulated. That is, it is the sum of the direct temperature effect on the organisms. This is the effect of the feed on these organisms, how the temperature affects the feed, and this lower panel shows the directional effect of the changes in sea ice. So the profile is quite similar for all of them, but you, if you look in the, in the upper panel here, the accumulated effect, there we see that in the North Sea, the, pure, the, the, the climate signal only has a negative effect on the species, the biomass is kind of pushed downwards, reduced. Strongest, of course, in the strongest scenario, and then weaker in the, in the more moderate scenarios. More moderate effect in the Norwegian Sea, and then you have the strongest, a strong positive effect, actually, in the, until 2041 in the Barents Sea. But you see also some negative effects where the sea ice is removed and the species that are connected to the sea ice will have a hard time here when the sea ice is removed. So <coughs> um, this is taken from a report which, which states that the climate change is the isolated is the most influencing factor on the various ecosystem components. And there is a high vulnerability. I will come back to the concept use here, but there is a high vulnerability from many of different parts of the food waves. And we already see in our observations these tendencies. So we already observe them. Um, another climate effect on ecosystems is, the, is ocean acidification. As you know, if, if, as you get more uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it is taken up in the ocean, and you get an acidification. And here you see acidification in two panels at the station, which is the old station 1M, for those of you who remember that, 
observation station, which is now uh, not, <coughs> or at least have been reduced. But you see here that um, in the scenarios, you see here how the pH develops over this, from 2000 to, two, uh, to the end of the century. This is in the RCP 4.5 scenario, so you see a relatively small change or a, a, a very moderate acidification. While in the strongest scenario, you see in, this, in the end of the period here, you see a relatively strong, a strong acidification. But again, uh, our assessment goes until 2041. So um, the studies that we have done, um, it seems that, that, that uh, together with, this is, these are simulations, but also together with laboratory experiments and, and other literature, we see that very many uh, communities or, or ecosystem communities are ra rather robust to this size of acidification. But there are some questions concerning corals and also mussels and a, and a few seabird bird, uh, species as well. But uncertainty is relatively high, and this is a quite this is a relatively new science as well. So, so the literature here is not big. Okay, so so at least <clears throat> if you look at if you look at this this figure. Um, you see that if you don't do anything, any mitigating effects, climate change will have a big effect on the ecosystems. So I think that should be um, balanced against, if, if you think of offshore wind as a, not only a power producing system, but also a mitigating system, that a system that can reduce greenhouse gas emission. So in that sense, to the extent that offshore wind replaces fossil burning, it will have a po positive effect in the sense that it slows down, slows down the clim climate effect. So any negative effects from offshore wind needs to be balanced against the mit mitigation effect, as I see it. Yeah, so what do we know about, um, about the effect on ecosystem from wind farms? We have a few reports here that have been summarizing experience from, <clears throat> from um, farms further south, Germany, Scotland. And also, <clears throat> also we have been doing a few um, uh, measurements ourselves also. But, but most of the experience that we have comes from bottom fixed. Uh, nearly all come from bottom fixed constructions. So the floaters are, are relatively, the effect of floaters we don't know very little about. Of course, some of, some of the effects that you see here can be transferred uh, and, and to some extent happen here as well, but, but wo most of what we know is taken from experience with these, these type of constructions. Um, <clears throat> so, well, um, what we know is that construction work can harm benthic and demersal communities, so particularly blasting. IMR also have ad advised against construction in areas where that are important for fish species which lay eggs in the sandy ground, particularly capelin and sand eels, which also are key species in the food web. Um, and also we advise against blasting work which can disturb spawning. Spawning areas are particularly vulnerable, so we should, be, should be take particular care there. Then, Background noise from turbines and increased ship traffic can disturb mammals and fish species that communicate with sound. And also electromagnetic uh, signals from power cables can affect species which use magnetism for orientation. So, so we know that this, uh, this um, will affect, these effects will kind of affect some organisms but the reach and the impact is uncertain. 
So other types of uh, effects that we foresee uh, on the negative side, impact on the primary production, the feed for the larger fishes, changes in small-scale ocean circulation, we know very little about that, but that can potentially impact the zooplankton communities. Long-term effect on the, on the population levels are also maybe one of the most important things that we need to look into. That you, that you affect local communities to some extent, that not will kind of ripple up on the populations, of, uh, uh, at least on the large species, populations or least species, that, that maybe we can live maybe with that, but, but we really need to know um, a little bit more about the long-term effects. And also continuous noise or electromagnetism and light, how that will affect uh, in the long run on populations. Positive effects is that um, these constructions, they serve as artificial reefs. So you get more heterogeneous areas and diversity. And also they prevent uh, fisheries, at least as the fishery directorate sees it now, that as for now the fishery directorate see these areas as exclusive for, for wind farms and are not, at least will not see any combination of fisheries in these areas. What, how this will develop, I don't know. And also on the positive side, um, as I said, the isolated zine, um, renewable energy production will, of course, um, or hopefully reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So um, what we see now is that uh, there are early plan plans for Norway. Different um, areas have been targeted. We have been in some of them, but we really need to map out there is a lack of mapping, and that is one of the things also that we want to make priorities on. There is another thing. Ocean, uh, <coughs> ocean wind or offshore wind is not the only activity at sea. So there is a lot of activities in our, sea area, in our ocean areas. So it's the sum that matters uh, when we, if you look in the, on the effect on the population or the, or the ecosystems. So we are working now on establishing a methodology that, that where we can, in a way, look on this accumulated effect of all human activities, where we can quantify it and look uh, and assess and assess the accumulated effect. So it's very important to not look at the offshore wind isolated. You need to look at it in also in combination with others. So this is a little bit about the approach we are developing. We hope to develop, uh, uh, or we are actually using it now, a preliminary version of it, to do risk assessments of the total human activity at sea. Also, I would like to say that, that we also see that wind farms can be combined with other industries. Um, if we are going to strengthen wind farms or the effect of the wind farms on the climate, for instance, there are a lot, not a lot, but there are several other opportunities that you can combine, industries that you can combine with them, particularly if you can, uh, <coughs> if you can grow kelp, for instance, and blue forests and a lot of the alga, alga species can absorb a lot of, 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 uh, of CO2. So this can be uh, also a strengthen offshore wind as a mitigation measure. It's a very efficient uptake, or at least potentially, it's a very efficient uptake of CO2. So <clears throat> this is my summary. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, you can read it yourself, so I can stop there. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, you can explain uh, without reading it uh, the, the, your summary, so to speak. Uh, you have seen the potential and, and the plans for, for um, 
offshore wind in Norway and the North Sea, mm. is that compatible with with, uh, w with your aims, so to speak, or are you, are you, are you on board, so to speak? Yeah, uh, <coughs> particularly if you see how, how uh, in worst case, how large harm the climate effect are on the seas, uh, the ecosystem, marine ecosystems. We, we need, some, need something that matters to mitigate or to, to damp that effect. So, so we think that, uh, that uh, this is a very obvious candidate. And also I think we can look into the possibility that where the wind farm industry can be combined with other industry to strengthen the CO2 uptake. Uh, th that natural systems are quite powerful uh, and the potential is big, but there is, um, there, there are a lot of, uh, I said, uncertainty and there is a lot of new knowledge to be made here, but I think this should be a kind of a research priority. Mm. Thank you very much. Now the, uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, the last uh, speaker um, is um, from Gasnova, uh, Ståle Åkenes, on Carbon Capture and Storage, CCS. One important technology in, in Norway as well. Your floor is yours. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, it's a tremendous uh, number of people. And uh, I also give the respect to those because we are standing on their shoulders uh, to deliver results for the future. So thank you all for that. OK. Um, I have been working with Gasnova for um, close to two decades. That's a long time. And um, the main focus of the, for myself in these years has been, as a chief economist, to, to follow the market trends on CCS globally. So therefore, I'm taking a rather broad perspective on, on this important issue. And my uh, contribution today is actually to, to look upon CCS going forward. Is that a, a technology that could be suitable for the future? Um, let me start with this illustration. Uh, this is the most technical illustration I think I will give you today. Uh, this is picked from the IPCC report, the latest one, um, showing how much CCS that will be needed by 2050. That is on the vertical axis. How much CCS will be needed by 2050 to reach the climate target. And on the horizontal axis, that is how much CO2 will be emitted to the atmosphere within 2100. So be, to be able to stay within the Paris Agreement, you should put yourself to the left of this black line. If you are on the left side, the emission to the atmosphere is low enough to stay within the Paris Agreement, and you see how much CCS that will be required. As you see, there's not one number. There's not only one number for how much CCS that will be required. It all depends upon the strategy for how we reach the climate target. There's a lot of scenarios, there's many pathways, that could bring us to a safe world. By the way, the numbers, it's easy to get blind. This is gigaton of CO2, 10, 20 or 30. Do you remember how much CO2 that is emitted from industry and from the fossil industry, fossil, fossil sources every year now? You remember that? Globally, 36. 36. My number was 38, so that's right. So you see that the top bot, uh, uh, dot there, that is 30 gigaton of CO2 with CCS by 2050. That is almost everything compared to one year of mission now. So it's purely about strategies. How are we going to reach our climate targets? And you see the bigger buttons here, this one, that is what uh, IPCC, IPCC calls illustrative mitigation pathways. So there's quite different type of strategies in order to reach our climate targets. And if you choose to have mainly um, renewable energy or you are 
focusing on reducing um, consumption to a level that is more sustainable, you are able to reach the climate targets more or less without CCS or very little CCS. But that, that's also a challenge. So, um, anyway, in total, you might say that CCS seems to be important if you're going to reach the Paris Agreement. And um, if not, we are going to change our lifestyle completely. At least this 10 gigaton number is approximately a middle value. So I will use that in the future, and you can compare with that one. So, um, so far, there has been around, there is around 40 gigaton, no, 40, 40 million tons, 40 megatons of CO2 that is captured and stored annually, globally, today. 40 million tons. What is to be required to reach the net zero emission by 2030, that is approximately or, or just above one gigaton, 1,000 million tons. That is what IEA states is required to be able to reach the net, net zero emission. Currently, there are plans for 240 million tons of CO2 by 2030. That is the plans accumulated, what we have today. Uh, so it is by far not enough to reach the what is required. In Europe alone, there are around 10 projects which GCSSI, Global CCS Institute, state as a part of uh, advanced projects that is more or less soon ready to be taken final investment decision, um, which is important for Europe. The European numbers for comparable for this one is uh, different from the different type of scenarios, but we're talking about like 100 million tons of CO2. So it's a huge gap from where you are now and until we reach what is required by 2030. Um, this represents a growth rate of 50% every year. So if you have 40 million today, we need 60 million next year and then 90 and so forth. And the question uh, I've got to try to answer, is that doable? Is that just a, a dream, or is it doable? So I will try to get back to that one. The main reasons, from my point of view as an economist, um, to the poor development of CCS the last years can be explained by some key market failures. First of all, the price signal to the emitters um, do not reflect at all the social, social cost of the climate change that the emission causes. Secondly, and that is more general, uh, secondly, it's important also that um, CCS involves planning of huge investments across, the, across different sectors to ensure that CO2 captured has available infrastructure to transport and store the CO2 once it's captured. Uh, this coordination challenge has hampered several projects in Europe, at least the last decades, and it will still hamper the new projects to come. This is type of chicken and egg problem because you often start with an emission point that, wants, that needs uh, to capture the CO2 and to store it somewhere. But to develop a storage site to be able to receive this CO2, you take often longer time and it costs as much money often to, to prepare a storage site. So it's a chicken and egg problem. The Norwegian Longship project, which was presented or discussed earlier today, uh, where the state took on a coordination role between the storage providers, like Equinor, Total and Shell, with the Northern Lights, and the emission points, was a very good example of how you can solve this chicken and egg problem. And there are also spillover effects that is important because... Oops. Spillover effects are precautions because the first movers are not able to capture the value of the project. So it's, it's expensive to be the first one on the block. In total, uh, these and other market failures have made it more challenging for investors to find a business case for CCS, and that's all about. If you not, do not find a business case for CCS, it's very hard to get an investment. Lack of business model is also often referred to. That said, it has been a lot of development, at least in Europe, also in the US, I'll come back to that, uh, the last years, especially after this um, uh, European Green Deal, 
um, with ambition for net zero and policy development, new support schemes and so forth. So it's a lot of things that has happened that is promising, but still investment decision beyond Norwegian longship remains, in Europe at least. So looking forward, what's the needs ahead and how has the need for CSS changed the last decade? Sticking with the IEA uh, and their net zero emission, uh, net zero by 2050, they suggest uh, just about 7.6 billion tons of CO2, that is 7,600 million tons of CO2 stored, recall the 10 gigaton, that is almost the same number. Um, so, but IA has delivered updates every year, or, or e even twice a year on these numbers. And they always change somewhere, or change in mix and they change in, in, in total numbers. And if you go back to 2009, uh, since I have been working for so long time, uh, I've tried to compare the 2009 numbers with, where they stated in report what they called, um, uh, uh, that was the CCS, CCS roadmap in 2009, and also in the energy transition perspective in 2010. They reported a number of 10 gigaton CO2. So here was a development that they presented for 2000 in 2010 up to 2050. And the interesting thing is that the 2010 number, or the, the blue line here, represent a CO2 reduction of 50% by 2050, while the, 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 the other numbers are representing net zero by 2050. So doubling the, or, or doubling the ambition, you can reach it with less CCS. That's actually what I have stated after 10 years. Still, it's a big number. It's a huge challenge. Um, so, but it's interesting to see how the importance of this has, has changed, and I'll go down more into that. Back to the realism. Is this possible? Is it really, really doable to, to reach this um, uh, target? In 2012, that is, I know it's an old report, but I think it's still valid. Um, the IEA GHG, uh, which is a branch of the IEA work, they made a report based on this 2010 numbers with the 10 gigaton CCS, which is a report from ECOFIS in, 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 the, in the Netherlands. <clears throat> they studied the build rate required to reach this climate ambition, this CCS build-up. Uh, and they compared the build rate required with other build rate development in the industry in the last decades and so. And their conclusion was that it is mainly possible, at least when it comes to capture part, to build and to, to, to establish the CCS capture facilities required um, to compensate or to, to capture these 10 billion tons of CO2. But they addressed a risk related to capture, uh, and, sorry, for transport and storage. And they addressed especially um, equipment like pipelines and drilling rigs, in addition to people and technical skills as a main risk. Uh, and they also uh, addressed the risk that re related to that um, the industry to, to, to cater for the storage part, which also addresses the energy, oil and gas industry. They are in decline at the same time they are taking over and doing a business on storing CO2. And the volume that is required to store is at a certain time will be more CO2 to store than it is oil and gas to deploy to the world. So it's a, it's a huge uh, uh, challenge also on the storage part, especially. Um, in Europe today, a few licenses of CO2 storage have been granted, just a few. And only one operator, to my knowledge, has taken a final investment decision to develop a storage, uh, which is open for third parties. And that storage takes today one and a half million tons of CO2, and that is Northern Lights. That is about just like 1% of what Europe will need in 2030. And that is only eight years from now. So, continuing, 
Um, others will follow, of course. There are projects in the Netherlands, there are projects in Denmark and in the UK. Uh, there will be some more storage pl places. And they will be funded by national support schemes, uh, connected Europe facilities. Those are progressing. Uh, but in total, this is far too slow to, to, in comparison to what is required up against the IA report. So, Capacity mapping, testing and verification of storage site takes time and is expensive and has to be funded by someone before they are going to decide upon capturing CO2. Most countries, it's important, most countries have aquifers in order to store the CO2. So the, these spotted areas here, there are storage sites uh, or, or aquifers which, where CO2 can be stored. And it's always cheaper to store it on land than offshore. But the, comp the, the competitive edge of doing it offshore is, of course, uh, when it comes to public perception and public acceptance. And of course, this North Sea is in a very good mapped area already. So they, have, they are in, in ahead of the buck. Still, it is a chicken and egg problem, and that has to be solved in one way or another. The other side of the story, when it comes to the industry where the C2 are to be uh, captured from. I think it's interesting to see how the mix of industries, mix of sources has changed over time. So in this illustration, I have compared the blue map from 2010 with the last net zero 2050 from this year or last year to see how much, what type of industries will need CCS for the next uh, 10 years. So this is a, a decade perspective. And the changes is not surprising there. The relative importance of the power sector has decreased quite significantly. We, we recognize that from Europe. Uh, in 2010 or those years, I think the perspective was to save the coal industry, at least from the coal industry side. So we can capture CO2 from the coal industry and the coal industry can continue to produce electricity with coal. That is far from the narrative you find in the, in the, in the power sector today much more in the gas sector and in much more peak load. So the narrative and the business model behind CCS on power sector has changed dramatically. When it comes to uh, energy, that's about, to a large extent, hydrogen. And I think hydrogen was were quite good covered earlier today. And one of the challenges there is all, was also addressed, that is to make a market for hydrogen. It's not about technology, to find technology to capture CO2 and to store it, but the market for hydrogen. So if the market develops, that will also be possible to do CCS. But that's a quite another business model. And the last one I think is interesting to point on, that is direct air capture, which is the most expensive thing to, to, to develop. But at least it's interesting because of the necessary ambition. So the point here is that what seems maybe small changes is really dramatic changes because the business model is changing. And what this point is on, it is, it is a change from reducing CO2 from point sources to, towards transforming the energy system as a whole. And there CCS makes an, uh, a role. Um, what I would like to end on is that Wherever, however you're doing CCS, you have to fund it in one way or another. And the lack of business model is a challenge. But uh, in the US now, this late summer in August, this US Inflation Reduction Act was announced, which also addressed uh, almost a doubling of the, of the payment for CCS made by the government in the US. Many raise their eyebrows about this one, and many investors have also pointed out that this can actually make a dynamic, a new dynamic for CCS, especially in the US. And CCS can also make a, a possibility to reduce the total CO2 emission that make the US able to reach the climate target. We will see how this will uh, evolve over time. Personally, I have a challenge to understand how we can make an industry in the size of the oil and gas industry worldwide only with funding from taxpayers' money. That can work for a while, but you need to find a business model that makes CCS business as usual and not something add-on in the end. 
So by that, um, my summing up, yes, I think it is quite likely that we need CCS. Has the need for CCS changed over time, last decade? Not really, but broader, more oriented against where it is, where it is business. Is it doable? Probably, at least technically. But I think we have to build up more efforts on the business model. I think that is going on. And storage capacity building is critical, is key for the future. By that, thank you. Thank you. We have half an hour for a conclusive panel discussion. Uh, what more is there to say? <laughs> uh, now, I just want to, to, to put a few general questions and you can answer as you please. Um, I start with the Norwegian uh, government's plan for building offshore wind uh, with 30 gigawatt by 2040. Since there are no uh, politicians here, as I mentioned, um, is that a plan which is realistic? And what should the politicians do to to improve the plan? What do you what do you expect from the politicians in this respect, Thomas? Goy. Yeah, I, I think it's realistic, but I think it needs to move from from plan to ambition in in the right way. There could be many ways to do it, but I think there are still some regulations and, and barriers in terms of uh, making readily available the areas to be built. And and while 20 years might seem like a good time. It's, it's, really, it's really an industrial scale up which is critical that we do in a sustainable way and building the right competence as we do it. Uh, another point from my side is there are many ways to do it and, and we should do it the right way. And for me, the right way would be to make sure it's linked up to a European infrastructure in terms of uh, a joint offshore grid and, and all the work we do in electrification and these early projects in, in offshore wind should be part of the next step, which would be this huge ambition for the North Sea that we discussed. Yeah, do you see such a vision now by the politicians? Uh, I, I would say that if this vision exists, it disappears a little bit in the discussion about radial cables and hybrid cables. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm afraid it's not so easy to see this vision. Uh, Simon Moxnes from Equinor, what's your uh, summing up of this topic? Yeah, again, realistic, it definitely is. And I mean, NVE is now working to identify areas, etc. Et uh, processes for coexistence are, are very important. And then, of course, 30 gigawatts for use in Norway exclusively, I don't think is a good idea, neither business wise or, or so, so. So we need some kind of connection to the, to the European market. Uh, because we, I don't think we can swallow all that uh, electrons. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, and, uh, but uh, but it was very interesting. And the, and the figure, I mean, for political acceptance, it's very important that we actually choose a, a structure and a, and a layout that makes sure that we have a, a call it a surplus in Norway that uh, protects industry and also the households because uh, we need uh, we need acceptance from the voters for the solution we, 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 we choose. Uh, can you develop that? What needs to be done to, to meet that? No, <clears throat> maybe remember that, that curve that showed the, call it the correlation between power prices in Norway and the surplus of, uh, of, um, of power. Mm -hmm. um, and again, uh, it's easy to take political decisions, but the politic politician must also survive the next election. So it's, uh, that, that's why I think it's important with an architecture that, uh, that um, uh, maintains acceptable power prices in Norway. And that is best done, I think, via a solid surplus. Mm. Yeah, Tande, you're... Yes, no, thank you. I think that uh, it's very good to have these ambitions. It's a, it's a strong, uh, strong ambitions to, to develop a 30 gigawatt offshore wind in Norway. And there's a lot of good work going on within and the EU within Energy department, division, mm -hmm. and within startnet, within companies. 
at the same time, to me, I'm a bit puzzled that, okay, you're going to invest something like a uh, thousand billion Norwegian krona in this during the next 20, 30 years. And to me, it's a good idea then when you're going to do that, that you do a lot of good planning and research in front to make sure that you are doing the right investments. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can even uh, save some costs by doing this. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of research having been done into the effect of research. Hmm. And basically it shows it pays off. It pays off a factor of 5, 6, 10, something like that. Hmm. So you can imagine if you do research and you save 1% of the investment. Hmm. Hmm. I think that's reasonable to assume that you can save maybe more than 1%. Maybe you can save 10%. Okay. Yeah, so my point... And then you don't see that reflected in research programs. Uh, the current government has actually cut the, the uh, budget for energy research. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so that's a paradox for myself. I, I just, uh, I'm personally curious of one, uh, one uh, question com uh, connected to this. Uh, I've heard, for instance, Martin Skanke is leading the, the big uh, NO uh, report on climate change say something like this, that it's not realistic to foresee, um, to keep the Norwegian uh, uh, price of energy in the historical low level as it has been up till now and, and the uh, energy uh, intensive industry has been built on that because of the development towards climate change. Is, is that a prediction which, which you agree on, that the price levels will, will be more, more equal? And what effect will that have? It's difficult to say. On one, on one side, we see that renewable energy are so cheap that you actually can get new capacity into the market without subsidies. And that is actually a quite new situation. Mm -hmm. New power capacity in a market has always been, I call it, a political responsibility, and most new power generation capacity has been subsidized. You don't need that now with uh, especially offshore wind, now onshore wind and, and solar. However, there is a system cost. There is a cost to balance that power system. And, and that is the key, actually, how are we going to balance the, uh, the European power system? A uh, strong grid is one solution, requires very strong uh, cooperation between nations. So, mm. that's actually key. It looks like you ask, I have some, mm. some further thoughts. Asker, yes, Thomas, go ahead. Yeah, mm. I, I think if you look at the cost of building renewable energy with, with onshore wind, maybe in Norway being the, the cheapest at the moment with 30, 40 euro per kilowatt hour, I, I don't think you can expect the price will always be in, in that range. But if you, if you look at the ambition to build these huge volumes of renewables in Europe over the next 10, 15 years, and we look at um, the Norwegian hydropower system with the balancing capacity that lies in that, it's clear that we will be on the right side of those cables that mm. we build. We will, be, we will have the advantage of being able to import uh, cheap electricity when there is a surplus in Europe and, and exporting when, when there is a shortage in Europe, but still being on the right side of the cable, being able to, 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 to have a lower price if we have a surplus, uh, like, like was mentioned in these uh, time periods. Uh, you could, could imagine we could lean back and just build the cables and assuming that we would be able to import cheap electricity that is built out uh, in Europe. Uh, the studies we have been doing in Trondheim shows that it's better to build something ourselves as well. <laughs> well, that was uh, maybe good news for the, at least for the Norwegian public uh, concerning the prices. Uh, I have uh, one uh, topic uh, concerning the future of natural gas, both in uh, Europe and uh, also in Norway. Uh, can you develop a bit on that? Uh, uh, are you optimistic I I in one sense about the, the need for natural gas in Europe? Isn't it likely that uh, the period of natural gas will be longer than you mm, predicted? 
Well, it depends a bit on the time frame and also on the, let's say, on the market that you look at. Um, I'm, I'm relatively certain for the end date, let's say for Europe, um, 2050 as climate neutrality target is relatively clear and uh, with all the skepticism on CCS that we just heard in the last presentation, I would say it's a fossil fuel phase out date, uh, 2050 for Europe, but the situation is very different for the rest of the world. Um, I mean, no other region has uh, such a strong commitment to their climate neutrality targets, even if they have some climate neutrality targets. Um, so I'm pretty certain that uh, Asia will continue to be uh, an important market for natural gas uh, even beyond 2050, um, which probably calls for more LNG coming from Norway uh, rather than pipeline gas. Um, uh, so I would say in the long run to 2050, more skepticism about the European market, but that doesn't mean that in the medium term, the next 15 years or so, there's still a market. Uh, I think that for that medium term, which is still long for, you know, um, um, paying back uh, investments and paying back uh, on, on capacity that's already in the uh, North Sea, um, that's a good market, certainly. Mm. Yeah. Thomas Gore, do you have a view uh, on that? Well, it's, it's difficult to predict uh, these things, considering that, that uh, if you look at today's electricity prices and gas prices, uh, I don't think anyone predicted those two years ago, but let's assume that natural gas will be competitive, uh, and, and I think it will be because there is plenty of natural gas in, in the world. And you look at the EU ambition on hydrogen. I think that um, I think that renewable electricity will need help from natural gas with CCS to produce the amounts of hydrogen that is going to be needed. So maybe you don't find natural gas in the system like we like we do today, but I'm sure that when you look at uh, global hydrogen volumes, uh, that natural gas could could still play a role. Hmm. Okay. Uh, hydrogen and also CCS are mentioned as what can I say, transi transitional uh, uh, methods to bridge the fossil age to the renewable age, so to speak. But at the same time, there were many uncertainties here in, in the presentations about the potential both of CCS and hydrogen. Uh, can you develop on that uh, uh, aspect? No, no, I mean, uh, first, you, you, you had a speech about the hydrogen. Yeah. Well, it, um, it, it, it's, it's a lot at stake, so to speak, and, and, the, and the potential is very uncertain. But yeah. At the same time, it seems to be very important. So the, therefore, it's interesting to... to yeah, uh, well, I, I'm mostly reasoned then from the public, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, many people are uh, uh, not very much in favor of these transition mm -hmm. uh, uh, solutions because they think you invest money in something that will not have a longer term mm -hmm. impact but but that might also uh, inhibit the development of the the sustainable solutions mm -hmm. that's uh, like only renewables or changes in demand which many people favor in, in yeah. respect. you so prolong are, the uh, the petroleum age so to speak yeah, by and this they, and you invest money in mm -hmm. something that you can't invest in the other solutions so people are generally in favor in more the, the truly sustainable solutions that where no carbon emissions are mm. involved anymore now, and if I can may come back to the, the issue that you were raising about acceptability uh, in the in the start of the discussion uh, about offshore wind as well, I think uh, what I liked very much in the presentation on the uh, uh, impacts the, the on uh, um, the en more broader environmental impact of offshore wind, where the, the, you started with saying, well, yeah, but let's first see what happens if we don't do anything, if we don't mitigate, then we have the true important uh, environmental impacts. And I think this is really important for public acceptability of offshore wind as well, that people understand that y you can't uh, be anti-everything. Because if you ask people about single <coughs> solutions, they're mostly not in favor of many of these. But I think it's important to raise awareness among the public that if you don't want this, then another solution should be there. And so that they uh, see the trade-offs being made and the pros and cons of different solutions because, uh, and that they realize that if they're anti-anything, 
everything, then nothing will happen, and that's a situation where we don't want to end up as well. Mm. So I think that's an important, uh, that uh, triggered me uh, when <laughs> I heard the, real, <laughs> the uh, presentations on the environmental impacts. Uh, yes, one more question concerning uh, the social acceptance of um, efforts to mitigate and, and um, uh, different solutions to that problem, which is of course a very big question. It's a, it, it, it's a polarized uh, uh, or, or it's a very upheated debate in, in many countries. Uh, what do you, uh, uh, what, what's your uh, opinion on the two, two uh, uh, camps, so to speak, on this issue? For instance, Code Red, which uh, the General Secretary of UN uh, pronounced, uh, or the people, uh, also people who want to to, to uh, push for climate change, who want to have some hope. I have heard um, climate scientists uh, warn against those proclamations, for instance, by Gutierrez, because they are not productive. So, what's your approach to that? Uh, I think only alarming people, making them terribly afraid, is not an effective strategy because then people get paralyzed as long as you don't tell them how we can stop it. So people should also understand how they can cope with it, how they can reduce the threat and what actions they can take to help mitigate climate change. Uh, uh, so hope is definitely important. Some alarming is important, I think, because if their people are not alarmed, they don't see a need to change. So, and we are currently starting some projects where we look into climate anxiety, which is a hot issue in many countries, probably here as well, that the youth is very anxious about climate change. And uh, oftentimes it's emphasized we should stop it because they, their well-being is harmed. Uh, and our uh, basic idea is, yeah, it should not be too much. But we should also not stop it totally, because if there's people are not anxious, there's no need to take action anymore. So some threats should be there, but we should also take care that people understand what they can do to help mitigate climate change and have hope that something can still be done. And the hope is still there, because mm. the, the main conclusions of the AR6 report was that we can still limit climate change even to one and a half degree, but that will not be easy anymore. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if the rest of the panel has a point of view on this. Yes, thank you. So uh, I started my presentation showing a graph of the development of land-based wind. And you remember it was uh, exponential growth, starting from sort of 20 years ago with 20 gigawatts of, of land-based wind, and today, uh, 20 years later, almost 900 gigawatts. Last year, it was installed almost 100 gigawatts on land-based wind in one year. So when we talk about targets for offshore wind, it's important to remember that because it's so easy to say, ah, oh, it can never work, it's, it's so much. We, yes, we can, I would say, in one year. It's, it's shown globally it can be installed 100 gigawatt land-based wind in one year. Could be done offshore also once the industry is matured. And then you see 300 gigawatts offshore wind in the North Sea is not so unrealistic in terms of being able to do that within the next 20, 30 years. It, uh, so that's one thing. So when people claim, oh, we're never going to make it. Well, if you make it uh, economic and acceptable, we can really accelerate, I think. And it's important to keep the hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, keep calm and carry on. I think that's uh, <laughs> Yeah. I support that nihilism is one of the big threats to, to, to getting the job done. Mm. It's so easy to say that, well, the scale of the problem is so big. But it's important to remember that when you are, when you are changing fossil fuels with electrons, you are also changing energy system and energy utilization. When you put petrol through an industry, uh, an, an, uh, uh, combustion engine, internal combustion engine, you lose 80% of the energy on the way, while an electric motor has, uh, has uh, utilizes 90% of the energy in the power system. 
we need some molecules in the energy mix also as we go into the future for planes, etc. But we really must be, call it, uh, we must think truly uh, uh, on which energy systems are going to get those molecules. What can be electrified should be electrified. Mm. Uh, I, uh, as I mentioned uh, when we started, I, my practice is in uh, Norwegian politics, so I, I, I'm, I have to excuse me for uh, coming back to that from time to time. <laughs> but uh, one uh, approach uh, in that field is that uh, the fragmentation of the political uh, architecture, so to speak, in many countries has of course, weakened uh, the political field. And um, instead of so-called so political leadership, you can watch uh, party, uh, political parties uh, being more egoistic and, in, and, and practicing infighting. And that, that's, that's a threshold to, to, to um, get action in this field. Uh, that's an observation, more or less, and it's not so, so easy to, to, to solve it. But are you, do you agree that this is, this is critical? It's yes. a political yes. question, I know. Yeah, but yes, but I think it is critical. Uh, in the IPCC report, uh, we also did a, a so-called feasibility assessment. So we assessed which are the main barriers or enablers for implementing all kinds of mitigation options, so uh, renewables, uh, CCS, uh, lifestyle changes. And one of the most prominent barriers that was identified were institutional, and it had a lot to do with political political acceptability, so political leadership. I think that is critical because the, uh, the another main conclusion was that the systems need to change, so we need to have changes in many different areas at the same time. All actors need to act as well, so industry, businesses, government, consumers, citizens. And to make that system move, someone should take a lead, and political leadership would be very helpful in that respect. Hmm. How, do you tr how is your uh, observation on that issue from, from a German uh, perspective? Uh, uh, is it the same picture there, or, or are we a special case? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you're a special case. I mean, uh, you have the heterogeneity also in, in the political system uh, in, in Germany just as much as, uh, as in other countries, so it's hard to say there's one observation, let's say. Um, and Germany currently has a special situation with the Green uh, Party in the government, and we still see that there's uh, obstacles and, and institutional, probably, uh, challenges to, uh, um, to, to adapt the system and, and uh, to induce changes. Um, but it's going faster than it probably would have uh, with, with another government. Um, but let me maybe also mention something more from the perspective of my research on, on, on fossil markets, where I think another uh, topic that still is uh, part of these institutional challenges is stranded assets. I mean, just the fact that um, businesses that are currently are earning money uh, from fossil um, sales um, are facing a, a stranding of their assets, of their infrastructure, of their production assets. Um, and are facing uh, the loss of revenue. And it's good that Equinor is sort of actively participating in, in this change, but not all companies around the world are, are doing that. I mean, if you look at the Asian uh, region or if you look at the US American market where we rather have a renaissance of gas and oil and uh, you, you know, sometimes even coal, um, uh, it's not a worldwide movement yet, uh, this energy transition, I would say. Um, and it's something that we need to keep in mind and it would be good to um, be a forefront uh, forerunner that is really um, uh, sort of having a spillover effect as well uh, globally. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I think we might uh, round up there if, uh, from my side. But uh, if there are some questions from, from the audience, we can uh, give the floor, <laughs> the microphone to them. There is one first there. I remember a very interesting curve uh, from one of you. Uh, I don't remember who. Um, <laughs> there was a, a relationship between a shortage of uh, water and supply from Norwegian 
water uh, uh, power plants and a uh, surplus of water uh, and a uh, surplus of power to be exported. And there was also a relationship to British prices and maybe German prices. I, I wonder how would it be if we re related that to Norwegian prices without subsidies, of course. Should you answer? <laughs> I'm not quite sure if I understood the question because uh, the graph showed that if we had surplus of energy in Norway, because uh, in the price area NO2 or Norway, as long as you have surplus in, a, in an area you, and you are constantly exporting energy, the prices will be lower in that area which has surplus. Yes. Yeah, of course. So that's the basic. And then, and then you inherit uh, prices from another price area. And then uh, the, the factor that set this price the most is the balancing cost. Yes. So, and that is in Europe, it's the gas price, of That's course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could you quantify it? Quantify what, uh, uh, how much uh, we... Um, you quantify it for UK and Germany. Yeah, the prices. Yeah, because yeah, it was, um, that was what the, the prices would be in Norway, all those dotted compared to what the prices was in the UK and Germany. So that the prices at that graph had high uh, CO2, and uh, so it was like 150 megawatts kroner uh, per megawatt. So, but that's... Um, Do you do that for Norway too? Yeah, but that is for Norway. So the, all those... Um, um, I should have had the graph up, but all those <laughs> dots represent the price in Norway at that specific, specific weather year. If you remember the graph, it said uh, one it said the price in the UK was this, this, and the prices in uh, um, uh, Germany was this, and then it was lots of uh, different uh, dots, and that is the price in Norway. So okay. all those dots represent the price in Norway. So that's okay. Then, can check then I understood the question at where that last. <laughs> <laughs> can check the graph uh, afterwards yeah. between your two. W was there? There was one person who wanted uh, to pose a question in the audience or two. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Norge Guru, University of Oslo. I'm a chemist, so I would like to make a comment on the question. It is be that transformers, transforming from molecules to electrons, I will protest. Because we need molecules and we need materials. Energy grids are made of materials. You saw the platform, you saw the concrete, all the steel and the plastics that are needed to protect the steel, etc., etc. We still need pharmaceuticals, we still need plastics. We uh, really have to know a lot about chemistry in order to deal with hydrogen, making green or blue ammonia, etc. So I think that's a very strong yeah, yeah. element for research in chemistry. <laughs> and I didn't mean to ban molecules. That would be <laughs> bad also for me. But molecule as an energy carrier will be more and more scarce and more and more expensive. So that was my, uh, my, uh, my main point, that it will be more and more expensive. I mean, if you have a good electron, don't make hydrogen of it if you can use it as an electron. But if you have locked in resources like in, for example, in Australia with vast, vast solar, or in Africa, vast solar resources, but you don't have the infrastructure to get those electrons out, of course, green hydrogen. I mean, you have the energy density and it's a good way to transport it out. Maybe not in form of hydrogen, maybe in form of ammonia. And by the way, molecules in form of ammonia, I think, will be needed to decarbonize deep sea shipping. I think that is maybe the best option there. Uh, my, my name is Tone Rand. Thank you very much for really interesting presentations. It has been a very uh, stimulating day. Um, it was indicated uh, that uh, the main replacement for natural gas would be electricity. But electricity has also to be generated and to be transported. Uh, and linked to this uh, are certain vulnerabilities and risks. 
uh, also uh, attacks, both cyber attacks and other sorts of attacks on critical infrastructure uh, in a very complex and unpredictable world. Uh, what are your assessment of this uh, complex of uh, problems? Thank you. I said this uh, on the replacement of gas, so I start. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, we addressed this now several times. Uh, you're absolutely right that there come challenges with a high renewable electricity system. Um, and uh, we discussed several flexibility options, hydrogen uh, as one of them, uh, but also um, uh, load management, which we didn't really discuss yet, uh, or, uh, yeah, and much more grid expansion. And, um, and I believe decentralization is also uh, one option that at least some areas in the world are, are taking and that are a little bit helping with the security issues that you're alluding to. Um, so we have a mix of... Uh, yeah, of changes uh, in the system and in a, in a system that will be made up of another mix of uh, technologies than the current system, essentially. Tanda. Yes, thank you. I, I believe that uh, the system is actually more resilient if you have it based on renewables than on, for instance, fossil fuels, because you have a more decentralized generation and uh, the generation is uh, globally spread. There is no, everywhere there are some renewable sources. Uh, so I think it also gives some geopolitical stability by going to, to renewables. So, and then, but of course you still have issues like power balancing and so on. And then I would argue that there are a lot of flexibility in the power system that we don't utilize today. Electric cars, water heaters, process industry, <coughs> There are a lot of things we can utilize for balancing without going to hydrogen. But hydrogen will also be important as, uh, for balancing in the future. Uh, but yes, I agree, uh, electrify what you can and then use hydrogen for, for the rest. Thomas uh, Goel. Yeah, I think it's an excellent comment and I think that uh, the last year has also increased the focus on energy security and, um, and uh, What's been, wor been working on in, the, in energy system integration for the last year is also sector coupling, where you look at how the interaction between the electric system, transport, industry, uh, and heating uh, is. Uh, I, I think in that respect, uh, you could look at um, the electricity needs in, in households and the thermal heating systems of households, and you could see there are some interactions there. In, in Norway, uh, we have electric boilers in central heating and also waste management. Uh, in other countries, you, you fuel those systems with uh, oil, but to a, to a larger degree with renewables. And I think it's, it should not be underestimated, these interactions between uh, thermal heating systems and, um, and the electricity systems and the flexibility that, that are there due to different heat capacities, for example, in, in water, in, in the house building materials. and. Uh, and there's a lot of flexibility to, to achieve with, with the sector coupling. Hydrogen plays a role because it can be stored and used in different sectors like, like industry and transport. But I think this resilience, uh, security of supply, uh, energy security, the ability to deliver on time, but also the ability to store, that will, it had a lot of interest over the last few years. It, no, it will not get a decreased interest, uh, I think. So, and, and I think there's a lot of solutions in, in place so we can be able to to solve those uh, those problems. I think in Norway, we, are, we, we uh, should make sure we are not building too vulnerable systems in terms of uh, relying only on electricity, for example, in, in heating private homes. Uh, but uh, these are problems that should be easy to solve. Okay, thank you very much. I think we conclude the panel discussion and the day of presentations with uh, that. And you want the final word, Mr. Elberey? Yep. And there is afterwards food uh, to be served. Just uh, to say that early in the winter, I, I think I speak of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, um, I called Tor Ulleberg and, uh, and Roger Sole. What should be the Vista Day this year? Then they send me the overhead that Mox has presented, the energy hub of the North Sea. And then we started. And then I start to call, write mails to the speakers. So thank you for your patience, for all my telephone calls and emails. Very, I'm very happy having you here around the table. 
So give the speakers an applause. And uh, also to inform you that yesterday we had a special day for the VISTA PhD and uh, postdoc and researcher. And so I think these two days have gone, in, have gone into really depth of the Norwegian contribution to energy um, transition in Europe. So maybe we could sit together and go through all slides and we have an excellent research plan for the future. Thank you.